I think we're going to go ahead and get started. I know we'll probably have a few um, stragglers walking in, but we have a lot to cover today. So um, I want to make sure we get us going on time. My name is Nicole Watson. I am the director of the Catherine G. Murphy Gallery. Um, I want to begin today by being mindful that we are gathered on land that is sacred to the Dakota people who have lived here for centuries and continue to live here. Thank you for joining us for this morning's gallery talk, which as you can see, we've actually moved into the lecture hall so we can utilize um, the projector. I'm very, very pleased to welcome Monica Rudquist and Judiana Frio, um, who will discuss their histories, creative practices, and approaches to work in their current exhibition titled Accumulation. I'm just gonna let a few more people fill in here before we get to that. So, okay, Carol. <laughs> We've got plenty of seats in here, everyone, so kind of squish in if you can. There's a few seats down in front, too. How are we doing? It's great to have so many students here. Thank you, students, for coming today. Yay. Yay, students. We, you know, we schedule these things in the morning during the week so that you can be here. <laughs> um, so if you've been to events here in the past, you know this is the point where I usually give a little bio about each of the artists. And I'm actually going to forego that today because I know that each of the artists has prepared a really nice and thorough presentation about their career. So instead, I'm just gonna tell you what the format is today. So each artist will talk for about 20 minutes and then each artist will take questions for about 10 to, five to 10 minutes. Um, and then at about 11.30, both Monica and Judy are gonna move into their respective galleries. So um, if you want to continue conversations or questions with them at 11.30, that's when we'll do that. So. Um, without further ado, then, I think I'm just going to turn things over to our um, ceramics professor, Monica Rudquist, and she'll get us going today. Thanks again for coming, you guys. Hi. Uh, thank you, Nicole, um, and welcome, everyone. Um, it's great to see such a great turnout this morning and so many students. So you kind of didn't have a choice to come, but, you know, <laughs> that's okay. Um, first, I'd like to really thank everyone here uh, that helped to make this all possible, uh, including the entire art and art history department, my colleagues that kind of put up with me through this last year, all the students, all of your great support um, and patience has, has really helped. And I'd like to thank the university. Um, I received two grants that really helped to make this possible. Um, I'm thrilled to be here today with Judy. Um, she's been a figure in my life for about 30 years, and I'm so glad to finally be exhibiting together. Um, it's been kind of a goal of mine. Um, she's been a role model of how to stay true to oneself while constantly pushing and challenging both herself and us um, with so many of the the different materials that, that she uses to create objects of beauty. Uh, of, I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous this morning for some reason. <clears throat> She's been a model of how to stay true to oneself while constantly pushing and challenging both herself and us as she has worked with so many different materials to create objects and forms of beauty. We share a belief in the power of objects and a love of form and material a practice based on intuition and curiosity. In my artist statement, I say I'm an accumulation. And in this talk, I'll share with you some of those experiences. What am I doing here? Sorry, just click, okay. So I come from a family of artists. My mom was an architect in a field dominated by men in the 50s when she joined. And my dad was a painter known for his mastery of inventive color. When I was little, my sister made many household items out of note cards and masking tape, uh, a camera and an iron with a masking tape cord 
um, are most memorable. I fell in love with clay early, early memories, four or five years old. In my father's studio at school, he taught at McAllister. By the time I was 13, I was hooked. I loved Marilyn Levine's work that both looked like clay and leather, as you see here on the left. I made this bathroom fixture at that time. It took me a long time to master the wheel, but once I did, I never stopped. My parents fostered my interest in clay by connecting me to Gail Christensen, whose work you see here on the upper right and lower left. She taught with my father at Mac. I worked with Gail in her home studio when I was about 12 and basically just hung out. I also took a summer class here in this same building when it was brand new, when I was still in middle school. So I have memories of that sometimes when I walk through the studio. By the time I started at Mac, I had already worked with Gail and her influence was strong. She made functional pots and large scale sculptural murals. As far as I knew, everyone did. Clay wasn't just about making pots. Gail retired in my junior year and moved to Sedona where she lived among the rocks that looked like her work to me. A former student of hers and Warren McKenzie's filled her spot, Ron Gallus, whose work you see up in the right hand corner there. I began working with porcelain, as you see here, during my senior year, and I haven't turned back. Today I can say that the responsiveness of porcelain works well with the quickness of my throwing. For the students here, uh, it took years to get to that point. Ron had a different approach than Gail. At the time, he would make planks of clay wood, let them dry, cut them with a saw, and then fire them and assemble them after with epoxy very different from Gail. He used bright low fire glazes and blurred the line between functional work and sculptural form. A pivotal assignment for me was to make a series of cups about cups, introducing the idea that function itself could be the idea. These images here are the beginning of what I called my Tide series. When Ron saw what I was doing, he suggested that I make 50, <laughs> or maybe it was 100. A huge number for a college student to contemplate doing, but soon became the, work, the way that I worked in series. The way of working, which is a way of working like sketching, quick gesture studies, being able to free myself from the preciousness of a single form, keeping pushing that idea forward. I'm still nervous. <laughs> the Tide series became the basis of my graduate school application. At around this point, I met Judy, and she was making her pillowy clay forms. I went to Cranbrook Academy of Art, which is just north of Detroit and Michigan for graduate school and I worked with Jun Kaniko. At the time, he was making his first dongo pieces, which you see here on that truck. <clears throat> this image shows them en route to the school studio from the Omaha Brickworks, where he built and fired them in a huge beehive kiln meant for firing hundreds and hundreds of bricks. Cranbrook was set up as an apprenticeship model, so we didn't have any classes. On our first day, we gathered under a beautiful tree on campus, and June told us that he worked 10 hours a day, seven days a week, and he expected us to do the same. He didn't believe in formal critiques, so if we wanted feedback, from him, we needed to go find him in his studio. Then he left. 
there were 13 of us, 10 of us first year and three second year. We eventually became a very tight knit group, many of whom I am still in contact with and are a very important support system for me. However, at that time, most of them had come from art schools. So I got a lot of questioning looks when they discovered that I had come from a small Midwest liberal art school. I was intimidated. Oops, where am I? I need something. I never made, I had never even made clay before, and I wasn't going to ask for help. So when it came to make clay, I called Ron, got a recipe, set to mix in my first batch. Well, I didn't quite get the proportion of water to dry material right, so I ended up making about a thousand pounds of clay. <laughs> I found out many years later that I had intimidated everyone else with that first load of clay. <laughs> So I was one of two functional uh, people in the studio. Both of us had moved away from function during our time there, although I stayed true to the wheel, never really stopping from using the wheel, even with these forms, as you can see at the base of these forms. I used my time in school to experiment trying different types of porcelain, and I discovered perlite, a natural volcanic material that when added to the clay would melt and burn out at certain temperatures or become pockets of glaze and others. And I became obsessed with creating these forms that had as much perlite in the clay body as I could get. I discovered at this time a love of process and material. My thesis exhibition consisted of this piece titled Throwing Wall. I was tied to the wheel. It included everything I had been making, simple bowls, cylinders, lumps of perlite clay, and everything in between. It was a visual record of the process and what my, kiln sh my, my studio shelves looked like. I realized that no one form was important, but the importance came when seeing it all together in context. I suppose I was accumulating already. When I returned home, I literally brought a ton, new, different ton, um, of perlite clay home in a U-Haul truck. I started teaching at art centers, and I made trips down to Rochester to teach during the summer. Um, for the program that Judy was involved in. These pieces include some of my first cut and assembled pieces. These are also some of the first pieces that consider the architectural space of the forms, interiors, walls, windows. In this series, window cut platter, these are the first cut and assembled platters that were hung on a wall. And I'm sorry for the old slide. Um, that was a long time ago. They were displayed this way because of necessity, as I had not originally intended to hang them together. Sometimes the best ideas come as, as a surprise. What, what followed was this piece, another old slide called uh, 56 saucers. Each is approximately eight inches in diameter. And I let myself do anything, anything goes. Squish it, cut it, fold it, draw on it. Um, the forms were made from the same rough texture porcelain that I used at school. The next piece that I don't, I could not find an image of, um, was called 100 saucers. It was put, laid out on a 10 foot by 10 foot grid and was exhibited at the new members show at Warm in 1987. For that piece, I limited myself to altering the form only by cutting. 
creating 100 variations of the cut saucer. I have found that creating limitations for myself is a way to open up possibilities for new discoveries. This piece, Cuban Mosaic, is a collaborative work that I did with my husband, Sixto. Collaborations are a great way to see your work through someone else's eyes and then through a new perspective. They're also a great lesson of letting go. For example, I started out through my saucers. My husband then went, cut them all exactly the same. <laughs> I shook my head. How could you dare do that? <laughs> it, it, it was such a foreign idea for me. I had to kind of tweak them. It was a conversation between the two of us. Uh, we've <coughs> continued to collaborate throughout their years. The title wall outside being one of our last with Judy. These images might seem a big jump, but all the while I've been working on the wall pieces, I continue to make functional work, primarily for family and friends. It wasn't until my son was born that I turned my attention to these smaller pieces that could be completed on a baby's schedule. <laughs> my intent was to make functional forms that worked really well, no drips, but retaining a strong sense of sculptural form. I call those pieces on the right boat bottles. And sometimes I think it was influenced by my main reading material at the time, which was Dr. Seuss. As pieces became larger, the forms became more complicated. I'd make many parts, random sized cylinders and bowls to be used as the parts. Then working from the bottom up, I gradually compose and build up the form. At this time, I also found a couple of glazes that I liked that highlighted the form. In this series of vessels, every side became a different piece. Then I discovered that when I added larger bowl forms towards the top, I could create more fluid movement, and the edges started to grab my attention. This led me to consider what I call reconsider, what I feel like sometimes I get really narrow-minded thinking, oh, well, a bowl is a bowl, whatever that means. Um, so then where the focus was more, I started to use multiple bowl forms to create a single, larger bowl form, where the focus was about the movement and the flow, the edges, that brought me back to considering the wall. <coughs> At about this time, I was doing about four or five art fairs a year while adjuncting here. I loved the interactions with visitors at the art fair because that was where I got direct feedback from the people that bought my work. And sometimes from people who didn't buy my work. <laughs> um, but I learned that I could push what I was doing and that people would respond. Take these intersecting trays. When I first made these forms, I had not considered putting them on the wall. But I took a, co a comment from a couple at an art fair about how great it would be to both use these during a dinner party and then hang them up on a wall with light bulb. I also started to push what could be done with a cup form. Cups could nestle next to each other and crackle glazes could break up the surface while pools of color could be on the interiors. Vases could be turned inside out to see the interiors, interiors and the walls of the forms. At this time, my mom was diagnosed with dementia and kidney disease, and I learned to be in the present. She had always told me to make what I had in my head 
because no one else would do it. So that's what I did. That became my mantra. What intrigued me most about these inside out vases were the edges and the top view. See the top view? Uh, two months after my mom died, I received a state arts board grant that enabled me to do a project that I'd long wanted to do, a large wall installation. The previous year, my family had visited the Alhambra in Spain, and I was struck by the way tile could change a space. I'd always wanted to do a large, cup, large wall installation of cups, but never was able to wrap my head around how I might approach it. Being in the Alhambra gave me an idea. I wanted to create a piece large enough to encompass one's view so that you might feel as though you were inside that space. It was a huge undertaking. Just over a thousand, let's see, I'm gonna position it. Just over a thousand cylinders of different sizes, thrown and altered. I ended up hiring my son, a new graduate, high school, college graduate, as my assistant. He created a number system to keep track of all the pieces. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was collaborating with my whole family at this point. My mother's mantra pushing me along, and the paper that I used as a template came from my father's studio. Everyone was involved. I titled the piece Intersection, as it represented a time in my life when all my part, all these things were coming together. It was displayed about a year after my mom's death, and it's eight feet tall by 24 feet wide. The piece grew organically as I laid pieces down on the template side by side to create these clusters and curves along the wall. And then there was this lovely surprise, the side view. You don't see that when you're laying something out on a table. After the ex exhibition, I wasn't sure what to do next. And then I got a call from Life Source of Minnesota, a nonprofit organization that facilitates organ and tissue transplants. They saw their mission in my work and wanted to discuss the commission. After almost a year of planning and working with contractors and architects on a space for the piece, Intersection was revised to become a 40-foot long piece and installed in the new headquarters in Northeast Minneapolis. It was a true collaboration. Over the course of two weeks, employees signed up for shifts to help install the work. You can see some of them there. And here's more. They took real ownership of the work, and I knew it had la landed where it belonged. The image of the two brothers tracing their fingers along the piece seemed to sum up the joy that it brought to, the, to that space. Which brings us to the exhibition two years ago at Edgewood College. My mother's jewels on the right, black and white revisited, um, and the back wall, and conversation bowls on the left. Back to that side view. Conversation bowls, perspective, the layering and movement, the accumulation. How can I get others to see new perspectives? That's what accumulation is about. The layers, new perspectives, and the time, taking the time to look closely and reflect. When Judy proposed that we call our new show, our show Accumulation, it felt like the perfect title for these times. I knew working with Judy would challenge me to take risks in my work, and because of these challenges, I am more energized than ever before. Thank you for listening. I even finished before 11. You're good. Well done. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions for Monica?
I use a knife. It's called a fettling knife. It's a tool I've had for probably 30 years. Same one. Yeah. What do you bond it to the wall? So um, each piece has a hole that's like, drilled in at a 45 degree angle, and they're hung on nails. Mm -hmm. So they fit flush against the wall. The large pieces and the small ones. Yeah. Black and white are colors. <laughs> <laughs> I like to joke that my father took up all the color, <laughs> and so he left me kind of the black and the white. Um, as you saw, sometimes I'll use them as pools of color. Yeah, for now, I mean, it feels like I'm really interested in the forms, and colors bring a whole other story to it, so the black and the white feel, for now, <clears throat> like the best, and the crackle. Sometimes you get a little orange in there. Good question. Those are all from the same form. For the last few years, I've taken a single form and then altered it. Yeah. yeah. Yes? Mm -hmm. um, I do a lot of walking around the, the bridges. And so most recently, the pieces in the gallery there, the, the far, the dancing vines, that came directly from these vines that are growing along, along the river. So kind of immediate uh, things. I, took, I, I look a, at a lot of things when I'm walking, you know, natural forms. And also in response to the different cultures, are you keeping the distinctions of the photographs? You know, uh, the, the phone with a camera is a great tool. <laughs> People will see me walking late to class, and I stop because I have to take a picture of something. Yeah, yeah. That's, I do keep a sketchbook, but not, not really of those kinds of things. Yeah. I wonder if after you put it all together, you can try it in at home and go and see that. <laughs> The smallest pieces are fine on the sheetrock, but most times I'm, I'm making sure that there's plywood behind. Yeah. Yes? I apologize for being a bit late to maybe no. the questions. I'm, I'm drawn to the poetry of your pieces, and when you perhaps take this film apart, um, how is it that you, you know, what part of that poetic experience you, or I see it as poetic. Mm -hmm. So do you see it as poetic, perhaps? <laughs> or is a language an understatement? Because I felt very right. visceral with mm -hmm. your work. Mm -hmm. It was a poetic quality. Mm -hmm. I'll have to say that I, I respond a lot to my work over time. Mm -hmm. So if you're responding to, you know, when you go into that studio or to the gallery space, you know, I'm still I'm still learning from it, mm -hmm. right? Because I don't when I'm working, I'm not really sensing that. But there's I, I mean I, I I know what you're saying, yeah. I'm just I'm slowly coming to that too. Yeah. Oh, 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 it's a it's a crackle glaze. So it's a it's a glaze that um, it's made of two parts, and when it fires, it splits apart. And yeah, I discovered that about five six years ago, and I really I really loved how it it broke up the surface, and it was something that I could. It was like a chaos that I could control, but not. <laughs> no, I just I mix it from two two different materials. Yeah, yeah, I can tell you know, I can tell you exactly what it is. So, yeah. 
Thank you. Okay, I think we'll have Judy Anna Frio come on up to the podium. And Judy, you can, yeah, <laughs> you can either click this or you can press this. The down, down one. So either you can click this or you can press the down one. Yeah, there it is. This, you should do this. You want me to? Yeah, because I get weird. No. <laughs> well, first of all, thanks to St. Catharines, and I loved working with Monica. It was uh, just something we've talked about for a long, long time. Monica's talk was so academic. I am so coming from nowhere. You know, I, <laughs> I'm self-taught, and uh, I, I love listening to the organization of the way she put the whole thing together. I mean, it was really uh, wonderful. Well, I'm starting out with Clay. When I came to Minnesota, Warren McKenzie was king, and I he came from Shoji Hamada and from Bernard Leach, and I came from Bo Diddley, <laughs> you know. And uh, had been brought up in the South listening to black music. And it was just a totally different deal. So I made these cookie jars. And the whole idea about them was that you, I put sticky stuff in the back of them. And you had to put your hand in to grab the stuff out. And it, in a way, it, it was a joy to get Mackenzie just laughing. I mean, it was just, it was always a kind of an interaction about uh, what I was doing and the way he was thinking. Okay. And, well, this was a stage. <laughs> okay. All right. And this one. These were great big buns. This one was probably about this big. And these buns were kind of done when my kids were little. And I always had dough raising all over the kitchen. And it always felt like a celebration, you know. And uh, then I put them outside, and they've grown moss all over them. And Warren McKenzie has a whole set of them out in his garden. And I don't know. They're just something that's been around for a long time and has gained age as they've been there. Okay. This one was done in 1970, and it could be hung with the work I'm doing today. But then I took a huge departure with my work, which you'll see, and came back. But this piece kind of it, it was at a point where I just sort of turned full circle and came back. Okay. This was when my mother died, and uh, it was uh, a, a large installation, and it was the title was "Give Me Land, Lots of Land Underneath Scary Sides of the Entire Song." Okay. And it was also the end of Clay for me. It was just like at the time that I decided Clay wasn't big enough. I needed to do more things and be more experimental. And so I literally left Clay at the time that I did that piece. This was a big piece that I did um, up in, uh, in Grand Forks. And I was really intrigued with stringers. And I uh, built the structure to create a drawing at night in the sky. the On the stringers, I rolled sheets with black powder in them, kind of like dope, <laughs> and had them on each staircase. So when the fire hit them, it would go up and over the piece. OK. And the, there was tar paper. Then I put you know white clay over the surface of the tar paper. So this is what it looked finished before the performance. The performance was at night, and I worked with the fire department. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, oh, I, I collect. There's so many things I'm not showing you, but at this time, I took tons of photography of this, and then did paintings as it related to this. And but anyway, and I did these for about five years around various places. Uh, and then I decided it took to. It was like being a rock star, you know. You had to, you know, 
do a lot of prep and a whole year of getting it together and whatever. And I, I missed the time in the studio with hands on, so I, I stopped doing them. So. This is in my garden, and uh, I, uh, I started working in the garden with mosaics first while I was still, I had moved out of my clay studio up and build it, built a new studio on the top of the garage and back into the hill. And this was the beginning of it all. Okay. Right now, I'm, you know, I keep change. It changes all the time. These are old photographs. You know, it's a whole different deal right now. George Washington kind of got rotty, and I'm rebuilding him. Okay. Okay. This was before my show at the Institute, the Judy Land show, and I was practically stuck to the floor. I was uh, working with Joel Piper, and you know my studio is 800 square feet, which is not entirely huge, and we were doing some fairly huge pieces. This was the entrance to that show, and basically, this is but well, and the front was Abe Lincoln and hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil all around the on the surface, and then thing Mrs. Butterworth was on the shelf right there in the middle, okay, and inside there it was I thought of it kind of like a garden, but there were like arches that had pieces large pieces inside of them, and then these big garden kind of compotes and my idea about mosaics was. Anything goes in terms of material from metal to glass to shell to whatever. And this was the exit to the show with Mrs. Butterworth floor molding and hundreds of buttons and little little plates that said Paul Bunyan and, you know, things that were meaningful to me. Okay. And this piece... Um, it was kind of like going for broke. I was invited to be an Ansika on stage, and I did this on stage, you know, and uh, built, I got her as far as I could go. I had to bring her back to the studio to finish her, and then the Institute had her in the front lobby for about, I don't know, six years. And uh, But she was like, you know, uh, Richard Dreyfus in, uh, when he, you know, built the, <laughs> The Devil's Tower out of Potatoes. <laughs> it was like going for broke. Okay. Um, can you? This is, uh, I was, had a big show in Madison at the Chase Museum of my new circus work, and this was the beginning of it. And this is my studio assistant at the time, Jeremy Kilkus, and he, I didn't want them to introduce me and say that I did all this fancy stuff. I just wanted Jeremy to introduce me. So he introduced me and got a standing ovation. So, ladies and gentlemen, now presenting the ninth wonder of the world, <laughs> the most astounding sculptor who collects astonishing objects for use in her curious creations, Ammonite from Madagascar. <laughs> Carbones from Montana, glass beads from Czechoslovakia, spigots, springs, and safety pins, crystal balls, cracked mirror crates of lamp pots. <laughs> junk dealers love her because she loves junk. She devastates flea markets like a human tornado. And she can smell a garage sale from ten neighborhoods away. <laughs> she is a magician who can turn mere wood into flying birds, pink foam into fish. And she is a grand master of no less than 43 different kinds of glue. <laughs> wondrous sculpture has mesmerized mortal men and women across the land. You too will be hypnotized. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the amazing Madame Judy! <laughs> <laughs> It 
was a hard thing to follow, let me tell you. I mean, <laughs> so this is one of my first mosaic pieces. It's called Deep Water. And uh, it's about eight feet tall. And uh, it's using, you know, everything I could get my hands on. Plates that look like water and stuff that made the swans that went over her head. And hundreds of bottle caps and mirrors and ends of little forks and knives coming off of the tips and whatever, okay. This is up at the M right now in St. Paul. And then <laughs> I had a big circus show at the Art Center and it traveled to like five different museums. <clears throat> This was, you know, all of the, the fire around the, the whole thing. It's, it's uh, well, the title of the piece is Meow. And <laughs> all of the spikes are like twisting. I collected old English tins from garage sales that were patterned and then twisted them all for the fire. And this is a drag queen in Rochester that came to the opening. <laughs> so you get an idea of how big these pieces are, you know. Um, uh, well, you've got two, it, it was all, I mean, I, the monkeys are, you know, this big. And the piece is about 15 feet. It didn't fit in my studio, so I had to sort of cantilever stuff. And at the time, I really, wasn't trained as a sculptor, so I had to figure out how to, and this guy sitting right here next to me, Tyler Forland, was the brilliant guy that figured out all the mechanical stuff to make this happen. Because the, the base itself was eight feet across the bottom. Well, I, the long and the short of it is I got cancer, and I just, cut all the color out of my studio and started working with bones. And uh, I'm fine now, and everything is, is good with the world in regards to that. But it really made me evaluate everything that I'd been doing for years, which was whatever. And I had collected bones in my studio for probably 30 years, but it had them stored underneath the back and had never used them mailed them to my daughter, who's a sculptor, and figured she'd use them, and then suddenly realized I needed to have them, and so she shipped them all back. <laughs> <laughs> but this, I have, this is a place I go to get them, and this was, you know, very rarely do I find a whole animal like this, and this was particularly a good one. And this is one of the places that we hunt for, for bones all the way down in this pit. Now we're in a much more beautiful place out in Chatfield in a farm that's just the place that we go is really beautiful and we're, we're able to get a lot of, I don't, I get very clean bones when I go out. I don't bring, you know, gross ones. And then we go straight to the car wash and hit them with high powered hoses and then <laughs> soak them in ammonia to get the fat out of them and then hydrogen peroxide to clean them up, and then, you know, a couple of weeks out in the sun. So it's probably a month before I get bones, and we go in the studio, and then I prime them and, you know, get them ready to use. So it's a pretty long, obsessive process. This is just to give you, I, I collect everything from owl pellets, where the bones are not as big as my fingernail, to deer, to... Whatever comes my way, anybody that offers me anything, I'm happy to take. People call me from the road and say they see a dried up deer in the ditch. Do I want it? And I always do. <coughs> this was a show I did at St. Olaf, you know, a few years where I was still using, which I'm sort of thinking about still, or those pear forms I was carving the fruits and still sort of interested in seduction a little bit and I don't know just this was a probably eight feet tall and uh, these were all much more painterly than what I'm doing now I was using a really thick uh, paint on them that made them almost look ceramic and this particular piece reminded me of 
some of those memory pieces, the old memory pieces that you see in, yeah. I also was, you know, out in the country a lot and looking at weeds and, you know, big chunky weeds and weeds that were really interesting and what they'd feel like when you'd yank them up out of the ground. Okay. This is just a studio shot of what it's like all the time, except usually when I'm in the throes of working, it's all over the floor. I love working with jawbones, and I like doing all the teeth, you know, it's just. <laughs> this piece was is in the show, and it, I, it put it in because, it, for those of you that know Don Wright's work in clay, Don was a very close friend of mine, and about a, two weeks before he passed, he mailed me all these bones. And they're very different than the big bones that I use that I get from here. These are really unusual, and they were very tiny. And Tyler came up with this brilliant idea of ever, instead of using screws and setting it in, we use wires to put, hold it together. And so it was a labor of love. Okay. And this is me with my two studio assistants who. Tyler being one of them and Chris being the other one who couldn't come today. But we're like a team and we really get along and it's just, I, I love my life right now. I love being in the studio and I love being with both of them. Okay. This was building the archway for the show at Rochester. And it was just, we're now working on another big piece on the floor that's the same challenge that this was figuring out how to build it and how to put it together and how to get it into the arts. So we had one inch to get it out of my studio. And it was night. The and this was a room at the art center where it was just this black room that they use for film a lot. And I went in it and you know, I built this big piece in the middle of it, and I thought it was just terrible. So I took it out and threw it in the garden and really got a sense of it. And I did this piece because all of my work has always had that spiral image in it. And uh, it was fun building them and interlocking all of the... I just stayed in there for a couple of days, interlocking the walls that went around. Okay. Then after that show was over, I just wanted to play. So I started... Uh, slicing up bones. These are leg, three leg bones. And they always, when you slice them on the bandsaw, they always come out differently and the forms are just, I'm not over this yet. I, I, I just still, I'm still into it. Okay. And this is a really huge one where there's a, that big form is a shoulder and you can just see the different underneath they're all leg bones that are sliced on the underneath surface and then the other ones are on top of it and again i got had another show coming up and i kind of left this behind but i'm still interested in it this was when it was raw after i finished getting it all together there's a surface of resin across the whole top of it this was still raw when i right after I put it together. This is a new piece that is just um, shoulders and it looks like a big sea fan. And Yeah. This is in the show and I, this one uh, odd what it what it was about for me personally. I just had a great grandbaby, and so I call it a bone crib. <laughs> and this was a piece that I took out of the art center and threw in the garden. And when I saw it with all, you know, it was really structured out of ribs. When I saw the forms that were on the snow, it started this new piece that I'm working on now. I mean, I wasn't interested in, I mean, it just, Every day I was photographing it, looking at the patterns in the garden. Okay. So this is like day one. Um, 
this was Tyler's brilliant idea, and I just thought he, I thought it was nuts. I totally <laughs> thought it was nuts, but we really were going to use it as a structure to follow to go on to the next one. So this is carved and painted, ready to go. So, and so it was really sort of you know in the beginning it's just like getting it going, but then you have to go back and elaborate and. So. And they're big and they're heavy, and this was, I love this photograph. <laughs> <laughs> we had it attached to the ceiling, and there it is. So where am I with my 20 minutes? <laughs> am I done? You're, you're in great shape. You can take some questions. Does anyone have any questions for Judy? Yeah? I, I have two questions, but I'll just ask one first. How do you apply the resin? Do you spray it or do you paint it? Pour and just do little pours and keep pouring and watching the bubbles and trying to keep in control of it. I mean, it's just experimental. Sometimes if the, you know, where you, when you slice a bone, there's a sort of looks like toast on the inside, you know, where the, and sometimes that'll pull it in really thickly and sometimes it'll bubble a little bit so you have to kind of pin prick it and keep it really clean and underneath there you can't see in these but there's mica and little bits of color that are mixed in some of those leg bones that you have to kind of look for i mean it's pretty subtle what was your other question okay yeah Yes. You just lift it out. See, it's three parts. There's the top part, the middle part, and the bottom part. And there's a iron um, structure that's under the bottom part that's kind of hidden in there. But it is really, I think it probably could have stood on its own. Don't, do you? Yeah. It could have stood on its own. It was really, after the first picture I showed you, you could see all those little leg bones. And then I sort of went back and did a little fluffy elaboration. And what we've been doing for the past year is if I don't have enough bones of any kind, we cast them. So when there's a lot of repetition, we're casting. For instance, on the three big wall pieces in the studio where there, you know, you, you can tell where I've been using cast bones. But I'd say all of the big, huge bones are definitely real, and the uh, a lot of the African uh, horns, which I love, which obviously you can't, you know, those are cast, and it's wonderful having a bucket like this full of cast bones, and particularly those ram's heads that are, you know, sort of like spirals, and yeah. Seven and a half feet. I think it's seven and a half feet and about 250. 250 pounds. But you got an idea with it when he was lifting it up on that board in the studio. It's but two guys can hold, can manage this thing. Yeah, yeah. It was you know it was kind of a fantasy like a lot of the vessels that I did right after. You know, I was ill. I mean, when I was recovering, Jeremy brought me, when he was my assistant then, brought me bones right in bed and a drill, and we started making those baskets. And uh, it always it goes back to clay, you know, and loving to make vessels. And when this, I heard that this was going to be at Inseca, I thought, all right, I'm going to make a big vessel, <laughs> you know. And so this was a real challenge. And... Uh, it was just, you know, a piece like this. How long did we work on this? Like three months or? Yeah, it's a lot of time. Because it's important to me that you can't see how it's put together. That you can, that it looks good from a distance. But if you're right up on top of it, you can't see any stuff. So, um, also, I, th I think that it changed really a lot when, uh, 
Madame over here put the lighting on it because it, I, in my studio, I didn't have the light on it. You know, I just loved the form of it, you know, but I didn't really know what it was going to do until it was in the gallery. And that was just a really nice surprise. So any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> well, there we might say we soft wrapped most of it. Soft wrapped it and got a big truck. And Tyler and Chris, you know, are magic. I mean, they manage to make it happen and they come up with ideas. I mean, sometimes we have to build it like a pie truck, you know, and put sh shelving in it so that you can put stuff in or various ways of, you know, handling it, but we haven't broken anything. And, uh, yeah. And this, this show, what did we, you had a, what, a 12 foot truck or something? Yeah, 15 foot wheelhouse. Yeah. And usually for most of the shows that I do, I carry it all in my van with the trailer, you know, but this show we, no way because of this big, big piece took up a lot of space. So. Yes. Okay, so you're sitting around your feet, <laughs> which is remarkably small for what you do. And the exit is through the yard to get the stuff out, and then you go around the garage, which is to the left. So under a pine tree. Yeah. <laughs> so, so does Jeremy or Tyler or Chris or anybody sitting around this? We've had these dreams of wherever this stuff's coming from. Do they ever say no? This is just too much. Never. Never. <laughs> well, it's too much of it, it's too much. Why you should speak to this, huh? That was the way to do it. I'm the part of it. Yeah, never. I mean, it's like the sky's the limit. I mean, th this piece is nuts. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know. When you think about yeah, it is. It is a tiny. It's. It's, is it as big as that gallery? I don't. Maybe. Mm, no, maybe because the gallery is not full of everything. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, you know, I've been a monumental collector my whole career, and I can't even begin to tell you what I've got stashed here and there and everywhere. You know, and uh, I the studio is now just full of about a thousand pounds of bone. You know, because you got to have you got to have a whole pallet to work with, and so it's so fun to go out to the farm and dig bones in the spring. I mean, I love to do it. My husband went out there and was completely grossed out by it, and all he could think of was, you know, uh, germs and you know <laughs> sickness and uh, you know whatever. But I look. It's like being a kid on the beach looking for shells and finding a new bone that you haven't seen before or something. I mostly love things that have a big curve in it or have the potential of that. And uh, I don't know, when we go out there, and we're surrounded by horses and a big bull that's always there, which always gets your attention. And, <laughs> it's, uh, and the lady, the farmer out there saves, if she has a particular say horse that passes that she loves like lucky passed last year she'll save it for me under a tree so no, the coyotes don't get at it and it just you know so i have some then it's really hard to use ones that are given to me especially but when i had my opening at rochester um three of the bone pit places i got bone farmers were all there at the opening and that was huge i mean it was just huge so Anything else? Yeah. Um, Tyler, you want to speak to it? Uh, it's um, just a poly, a classic two-part beginning, and we uh, it's passed a lot of circles. I forgot, and I got the formal name of it yeah. the other day, and it's uh, totally <laughs> lost it. You know. We get it from Sterling Supply here in Minneapolis, and we make the mold, and then what we cast is strong as bones, you know. 
I mean, I, I, we like working with them because they're light and they're strong and they're really easy to work with. How do you uh, decide what shape? Well, I mean, for instance, I have a horn that I, I think I found at a garage sale, mm -hmm. but it has this beautiful arch to it. And it's perfect for, you know, I mean, I if I, I can <coughs> just show you all over it where I've used it. Well, that I need buckets of, yeah. I need lots of that. And these little kind of curled arches, I need a lot of those. And they're just certain ones that are obvious, you know, that are going to give me the kind of motion. Recently, we've uh, got uh, one of the long African kudu bones we've chopped up so that you could actually bend it and use sculptural <laughs> epoxy, you know, to to make it work as an arched form. So I don't know. It, it's any way that it can work. Am I done? <laughs> Do you want to be done? I'm sensitive because I know students have to clean class this week. So I'm going to suggest that if you have more questions for the artists, they're going to hang out in their gallery spaces for a few minutes. So. Um, please feel free to stick around if you'd like to, otherwise I'd like to